Well, good morning, everybody. It is um, an incredible privilege to be able to stand up and start to leak out the little bits that are going on inside of me and share with you. So I thank you for your attention and to listen. And I just, um, yeah, I, ju I just want to pray again. You can pray for me. Um, so, Father, we, we just want to invite your Holy Spirit to come and minister to the deep places of our hearts, our minds. Father, that you would draw us deeper towards you and towards one another, that we may become the people and the community and the environment that heaven really can break loose and bring glory to your name. We just invite you to minister to all of us, myself included, in Jesus' name. Amen. So my first note to you today, the most imp well, one of the most important things I want to say to you is, I want to invite you to access our Hope Church website, and I would like you to make time and go back and listen to a message preached two weeks ago by Joe Mummery on relationships. And I want to say that because it was awesome. It was setting something. It was the very heartbeat of the direction of what God is wanting us to step in. And we're on our way, but there was such treasure. It was prophetic. It was clear. And it will be 45 minutes well spent. It wasn't that long. But do, if you've never, ever downloaded a message ever before from the website, download that one. So that's my first message to you. Um, so I want to talk to you about relationships and connection. Um, excuse me a moment. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about relationships and connections that will create and cultivate, cultivate this environment that truly reflects the heart of the Father God and an environment where all mankind, believers or none, can experience the goodness of God and an environment where healing and wholeness and inner transformation are a com natural consequence and in an environment where, that's filled with hope and joy and rejoicing and an environment where revival of heaven really does break out. So the fact that we're created for relational connection is not new news to many. But, I don't know about you, I find that quite challenging, this whole connection thing. Um, so today, I'm going to be speaking largely about my, or for myself, um, and sharing from some of my own very recent experiences and some of the things that Father God has been teaching me and continues to teach me um, through them. Um, I feel that um, I'm really beginning to cover what seems to be a million miles that exist between knowledge and experience. I have had the joy of walking with Jesus for more than more decades than I perhaps maybe want to admit. Um, and in that time, I have learned a lot of knowledge. I've known a lot of things. I've known what was true. I know the Sunday school answers. But this last season I have just walked through, I'm finding that I'm experiencing some of those things that I thought I knew. And uh, I have spent the last few weeks chatting through um, friends, many friends actually, as I've tried to prepare for today and sharing uh, what I wanted to talk about, which is largely about the ability to be vulnerable and to share what's really going on on the inside. And uh, a dear friend said to me, <laughs> I've been um, thinking about whether I would ever tell you this and reminded me, so I just want you to picture the scene. I've just gone through this raw time and uh, gathering up the courage. And what she shared with me, actually, although I was totally mortified, I was able to go, God, you are so good. Your glory has been seen because I have, I'm moving somewhere. And she told me, as I was saying, that you know, my heart desires is that we're able to really share intimately how we're really doing rather than the mask face. She said, you know, 
four years ago, it was four years ago, but it was a small consolation to me, when she tried to do that with me, I had responded in a very unhelpful, painful manner for which I was truly, truly sad and sad about. So anything I share with you today is is a fresh journey. It's not something I've known for years. It's something that I'm learning to do better. So I just want to invite you in to my journey. Um, I am wearing L plates, or at the very most, P plates. You know, a kind of... So that's how it goes. So, And um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I was... Uh, putting together a little patchwork of what my life's careers have been like. And it was like, oh my goodness, I've done quite a bit, actually. Um, so I started out, I trained as a nurse. Um, I worked as a nurse, and then I went on to be a health charity worker. I had my family. That was, um, and continues to be, a career path all of its own. Um, and then I had some time in primary education. I have been a counsellor. I have been a citizen's advice advisor. I've worked in an orthodontic practice, I've been a pastoral worker, I've been very involved for a lot of years in inner healing prayer ministry, I've been a church leader, and latterly, I've been a mental health patient. Pin drop. <laughs> um, so I'm also a parent, a daughter, a wife, an amma to my three little grandsons. Um, I'm now 52 and three quarters, and it sounds a bit like Adrian Mole for anybody who you remember those stories. Those three quarters seem to be quite significant because although through the decades, I've always said to people who are behind me, saying, you know, you think you're going to have a nervous breakdown when you're 20 and then 30 and then 40. These are all big milestones. But the truth is I have seen and experienced great, great things in all of those years and every decade has brought something very deep and significant and very precious so I don't know where you are all along that journey but every decade brings something fresh and exciting and very precious so it's a journey um, but the truth is until quite recently I would have said that my 50s have been quite difficult times and uh, I'm glad to say that I'm beginning to see the goodness that's coming out. So it's all looking good. Um, so around that time, at 50, two and three quarter years ago, it seemed that no member of my family and people that were close to me were untouched from a whole catalogue of things that were going on, be it health issues or death or upset or challenge or whatever. And I have to be honest, I felt quite shaken and quite exhausted by the whole process. We had about, I don't know, five, seven years of things not going quite so swimmingly well. Um, and with families, it never happens at neat moments. You know, if you have a large family, it all seems to go off at once. It's like, oh my goodness. So I, yeah, it was a bit rough. And, um, but God was very, very good and very present in that time. But I cannot say that I was singing hallelujah all the way. It was challenging. Um, and as I look back through life and all my relationships that I've had, and I've had neighbors, friends, family, atheists, agnostics, lots of people of different faiths, and lots of people who follow Jesus. And as I've looked at those relationships that have carried me through these various seasons, I've been asking a question, what was the basis of the friendships that I had with all of those different people? And they were all precious. Um, but the truth is, as I've looked, I've realized that some of those relationships were based on, um, well, they were gap fillers at times when I was really exhausted. I wasn't really thinking too much about the relationships. They were just there. They were the people I happened to be doing parenting with. They were the people who I saw as I went out my door. They were the people I saw, I saw at the school. They were just gap, they, they were happening around me as I was trying to put one foot in front of the other. Um, they were very precious, I have to say. And actually, last year, when things were really difficult for me, it was the people back in the very early days of the real young parents, you're amazing. I just want to say, you are amazing. I, I remember quite well how that was. But those friendships that were in that, that time were the ones that I didn't have to explain myself in. And they were very precious. So there were, the, there were those kind of relationships. Sometimes the friendships I had through the years have been a little bit performance-based, if I'm honest. I could always 
bring a smile. I could always do an open home. I always had a great capacity for more on a physical level. Um, I've been blessed with a fairly large capacity, which I thought was normal, but I think is a gift. Um, and I've always been able to be enthusiastic about my special interests that happen to be somebody else's. Like if somebody starts to talk about music or the, the outdoors, I can get enthusiastic. So th they would be based around some of those things. Um, but I did wonder how many of my relationships have been based on daring to reveal the real me. Or were they just based on some of those other things? Was I able to share my insecurities or my uncertainties? Um, was I able to share my anxieties or my fears? Or my emotional state? Or my hopes and dreams? Or my spiritual state? Was I able to share my relationship and connection or lack of it? Or my frustration with it with Jesus or Father God? Or could I only ever share when I was doing great thanks? I'm fine. Um, so I've been doing a lot of thinking and a lot of questioning. Um, and I often thought, actually, my friendships with non-believers, people who didn't know Jesus, they were often a bit easier. They were less judgmental. They were a little bit more accepting. But the truth is, they required less of me. I didn't have to invest quite so much. There was not so much at stake. They were very precious, though, and I am very thankful for the people that God put in my life in those phases. Um, so I wonder how much of my relationships through the years um, have been devoid of any fear of judgment or rejection or shame. And I've been doing a lot of stock taking, as you can hear. And my answers to any of those questions that I've just asked would be varied depending on when you asked me. Um, so 18 months ago, I found myself quite withdrawn and quite afraid. I had allowed myself to become quite isolated and as a result, I was beginning to unravel deep on the inside. And I, at that point, did not know how or have the strength to reach out or call for help. I just got stuck. And um, I didn't realize, actually, until I stopped functioning. And it felt to me at that stage a bit like physician heal thyself, um, because God had done lots. I had seen... God do amazing things in my life and around those around me through lots and lots of years. But in that period, I just felt I went through a process of my core identity being assaulted, actually. And my voice was being silenced, uh, discredited, mainly by myself. Um, and my mental and emotional well-being was a little bit unstable and not very safe. And uh, when you're 50... You really should have learned how to do that by now, shouldn't you? Or should you? But that's just how it was. Um, and I'm not telling you this because I want you to feel sorry for me. I'm telling you this because I believe that God wants us to be able to talk about these things, to actually be able to share these things and bring release and freedom. So when other people are finding hard times, we don't try to fix it or tell them it's all going to be okay. That actually we can learn what compassion and empathy truly is. And actually we can, can be secure within ourselves and we can respond with love and not feel fear from them just because they're having a hard time and I don't know what the answer is. This is why I'm telling you this stuff. So I don't want you to go away feeling sorry for me, okay? It's all good. Um, so I then began this journey um, with my L plates, which slightly progressed to P plates and sometimes I feel like I'm teetering between, but we're going, we're driving now, we're doing, we're getting there. So I started off this journey um, learning how to look after my rather fragile mental health. I had to learn how to look after my physical health. In that period, I hadn't realized that a pain with my shoulder was actually a serious problem. I very foolishly just thought, it's just your age, dear, which my husband keeps saying, Jan, you're only 50. It's not your age. Um, I had to work hard at how do I begin to let people in and see me as I really am. Um, not the way that I feel they wanted to see me, or I'd fall into the habit of projecting myself. Um, and I had to learn how to communicate that. I had to learn a new language. Of how do you say these things after... Because people know you. They, they, know, they, know, they know that person they've seen for a long time. It was learning this new vocabulary, learning where do I start. I can't do it with everybody. It's too exhausting, so I had to find one person. 
and then two people, and then three people, and then it starts to get bigger as we go along. But that's what I had to do. I had to learn how to establish boundaries that would prioritize connection and relationship. And I had to learn how to take down the barriers that I'd put in place to keep myself protected and keep everybody out because I was feeling so afraid. Um, those are not boundaries, just for the record. So I did feel quite handicapped because I am actually an introvert and I energize by time on my own, um, which a lot of people I don't think really understood at the time, and I'm more sensitive than is always good for me. Um, so I did feel like I was walking around with a permanent limp. Um, one thing I realized in all of this is that personality in an unbounded culture that's devoid of honor and respect of others can be truly devastating. And I had actually been a culprit as much as a victim because I had not learned how to do many of those things, and that's the journey I find myself on now. So that statement's true both for extroverted personalities and introverted personalities. We have some precious things to learn. And um, so at that time, I wasn't holding on to the very best tools. I could hide expertly. And I was hardwired through my upbringing and the culture that I'd been in and the jobs that I'd taken on. I could get a job done. That was what was hard on my inside, and I had learned how to ignore myself, my feelings, what I needed. I had those skills to a PhD level. I was a wreck. Anyway, the result was I stopped functioning. So I experienced a great deal through that time about things that I had previous knowledge about, and it was a humbling experience. And I, 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 I deeply love music. And I find music, um, it's a tool that has ministered scripture to me from the minute I heard about Jesus. And songwriters, you creative people who can do that, keep doing it. Because often it is scripture in song and music that activates spirit to spirit. The spirit behind scripture reaches a deep place. And I, I, I have many favorite, I, I wrote a list of some of my favorite scriptures, and there were far too many, but, you know, an old classic that everybody knows, but only when I truly hit really rough times, which I've done a few times, not just recently, in Psalm 23 about, you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil. Um, and the song that has this line, your love carries me through all the valleys and the darkest places. That's been my experience, that we go through these things, but actually it's the love of the Father that carries you through. And when you're in it, you're not always sure you're going to reach the end. I'm here to tell you, you do. And his love just goes so far um, so, from the very beginning of man's existence in Genesis, we read that we're all, cre we're all created for this connection. There's this idyllic scene. Adam is created, is put in this garden. Him and God are like this. They're having a great old time. And by, um, we hear that in those days, God said, you know, he made man in his image that we were made to be a full reflection of him. Um, with the capacity to outwork that. Um, by Genesis 2, God is saying, see all of this amazing place that I've put you, all of this provision, it's all yours. You can have everything, but see that there, that tree, all the stuff you see is good, but that tree there is the knowledge of good and evil. Don't touch that. It'll kill you. But, Adam being Adam... Um, he did. Um, God had made him a helper by this point. And by Genesis 3, you come across something that if you've never come across this before, I want you to have a look. This is Satan's strategy for challenge. I recognize it as something that I've lived with all my life. And Satan's strategy of challenge looks like this. Did God really say? He questions Eve's ability to e even hear God. Challenges whether God speaks at all. And if God has spoken, is what God said is going to happen really going to happen? And he questions Eve's identity. But God had already clearly said, I've made Eve in his image. 
So Satan just always challenges identity. So their classic, you know, ABC of living life, if you don't know that before now and you wonder why you get discouraged, just go back and look at that because those are always his strategies. He never comes up with a new one. It's always the same. So up until um, eating the wrong fruit, Adam and Eve had only known good. They'd experienced love and all that came through their identity with sons. They knew acceptance, they knew affirmation, they knew trust, they had trust, they received trust, they had intimacy with the Father, and they had connection with him and with each other. It was, it was pretty perfect. But after that point, Adam and Eve then knew, tasted, experienced evil. And um, although not a lot had changed in their physical state, everything had changed. And they were naked, just like they were before, but something significant had changed. And they had experienced shame and fear. And I just want to say something about guilt and shame. Sometimes, well, often, I found myself lumping those two words together, thinking they're the same thing, and they're not. Guilt is something that I did wrong. I did something wrong. Shame is something completely different. Shame is, I am wrong. And you can do something about guilt, but shame is something that totally locks you down and isolates you. And Adam, in this moment, um, was afraid and was carrying shame. And so the familiar voice that he'd always heard, Father God in the garden, it was a very familiar sound. But because of the shame... His response was a different response. It was a fear response. It was full of shame, and he ran away and hid. Now, did they just want to um, control the outcome of the conversation? Um, they certainly didn't want to be seen in that moment, and they didn't want to show up for the conversation with God in that moment. And I wonder if they just feared rejection and judgment in that moment. Is that what motivated them to run and hide? Whatever it is, it was a shame response. God asked a question. Who told you all this stuff? Remember that, because when you're struggling, ask that question. Who told you? Who told you all this negative stuff? Where did that come from? It didn't come from Father God. Um, but Adam, true to form, embarks on a strategy in that moment of shame, blame shifting. Didn't take responsibility. He blame shifted. Adam, it, it, was, it was the woman. The woman told me, and Eve did exactly the same. The serpent told me to do it. And I have to say, I wonder what would have happened if Adam, in that moment, had taken responsibility for what he'd done and said, I did it. My relationship with you, Father God, really matters to me. I'm sorry. Can we try that again? I need some help with this. But we know he didn't. But I do wonder what would have happened if that had been his response. So God put them out of the garden, so it says in the words, that, so that they could not reach out and take from the tree of life and live forever in their fallen state. Again, that model of God and Adam in the garden, I feel, was the perfect model of what God wanted to experience with us. And as that community in that garden grew, that was the experience that God and the, the template of how he wanted kingdom living to look like. Um, what I find fascinating is after God put Adam and Eve out of the garden, he then said, God said, I don't want them to touch the tree of life. And he, he didn't warn Adam about that tree before he sinned. Was that because he expected to live with Adam and Eve forever in that perfect state and to live forever I don't know but it's just worth questioning so it's food for thought so last year when I hit my wall or the year before as it was I I hit the wall and in that process I was obviously becoming aware of myself of what was going on something I'd managed to hide myself from and my first response was not to run into the arms of Jesus at that point my first response, well, I felt afraid. I felt ashamed. I felt angry at what was happening to me. A friend asked me, I actually felt numb to start with. And it was only a little bit later, maybe a week or two, as I started to realize the enormity of what was going on. 
um, my dear friend Pete Carter phoned me up and he said, Jan, do you think you're angry? I was like, angry? I don't think so. But uh, that question stuck with me. And as I started to ask God the question, was I angry? I then got in touch with, man, I was angry. I really was angry. And I had to process some of this stuff. But it was very dark and I couldn't see the wood for the trees. And my response was, run and hide. And run and hide I did. Um, but this is where amazing truth is just so wonderful. You know, dark and light can't occupy the same space. And the same is true with fear and love. And light eradicates the darkness and love eradicates the fear. And that was the process that I embarked upon. So it was very, very dark. And then Jesus started to turn the light on. And the fear that I felt was then replaced by love. And that then brought a, trans a transformational work in that process. So I was able to share with my feelings with Jesus and um, the journey began in true, true fashion. So I want to mention a little point I could probably do about six preachers on about vulnerability and transparency, some of the things that I've been learning about. And these, I believe, are the essential ingredients for strong and healthy relationships. So what is vulnerability? What has vulnerability been in your culture? Has it been weakness? That's what I thought it was. I thought the vulnerability meant being weak. And in Britain, we have a culture where it's the stiff upper lip, the show must go on, keep the mask in place, it's all about appearances and performances at any given time. And if it's not looking good, stay, just stay indoors, don't let anybody see. But I just want to share this wonderful quote with you. Um, Vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they're never weakness. Never weakness. Vulnerability also is allowing yourself to be exposed to the possibility of being harmed or attacked physically or emotionally. But vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they're never weakness. And I went through the process of understanding what was going on, what was true, and being able to share what was true. And that truth was scary. And I feared judgment and rejection and shame. You're not supposed to feel like that. You're not supposed to experience these things. But actually, as I started to share... What I experienced was the love of the Father coming back to me through the relationships. And that's where the light and the life starts to flow. So who on earth can we learn this vulnerability from that looks like this? I wonder. So Sunday school answer, who can we learn this from? Yay! So is he not so amazing at modeling these relationships he had lots of relationships. He was a son, he was a neighbor, he was a student, brother, friend, a rabbi, a freedom fighter, a miracle worker, and a bit of a troublemaker. Um, but he modeled vulnerability right at the first instance by coming to earth as a human being. That was vulnerable. That took courage. And I wonder, what was his motivation in doing that? Was it just a fact he was under orders, he had to do it? Was it just the right thing to do? Was he reluctant? Do you think it was easy for him? I've often wondered, what did it take? What did he feel by showing up on the planet as a human being? That would have felt different to his experiences up to that point. And we can learn all sorts from Jesus. His compassion and empathy, his ability to take perspective, to set boundaries and Again, we could, we could go off on all of those points, but he's the perfect model. But I want to just point you towards Ephesians 4, which it reads a little bit like um, a relationship manual. Um, so you, if you read it from the beginning, we're not going to this morning, but just down to verse 31, it says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be, be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love, as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We, as a community, are to be a sweet-smelling aroma 
our relationships, what we create, what we share one with another, is to be sweet. Um, so Jesus is very, very good at this relationship and communication business, I've discovered. Um, but I do sometimes feel a little overwhelmed and feel that he definitely had an unfair advantage. I don't think he was starting from the same place as me in that process. It's marvelous, and I love it, and I'm totally inspired. But as I've been thinking about this, I was thinking, who else can I look at that I might be able to relate to in a slightly more realistic fashion? And I was drawn to the book of Philippians, and I was drawn to Saul of Tarsus. For those of you who don't know Saul of Tartus, he was the real meanie. He was the bad guy. He was, I'm not saying that I'm totally bad, but I could understand some of the ways that he operated his relationships, how he connected, how he behaved with society and the people around him. So Saul was a Jew. He was born in um, Turkey. He was a direct descendant of the line of Benjamin, so he was a true Jew. There was a hierarchy. He was the real deal. And he studied um, the Jewish tradition under a very reputable rabbi. He had a great teacher and was a real upholder of the Mosaic law. So he was a zealous Pharisee. And a large part of what we read through Acts of him in that role, him behaving that way, conducting himself in that fashion was he was a persecutor of the Christian church. And persecute he did. And when you start to study what that looked like, they say actually he was a terrorist. They were acts of war. They were crime. In fact, he was the man that condoned the first ever martyr, Stephen, for preaching the gospel of good news and the gospel of grace. So I want to pick up a story in Acts 9, verse 1. And I'm just going to read through. No, I'm not. Actually, you can go and look. I just want to... I want to just, I'm just going to scan through it for time's sake, but do go and read this. So in Acts 9, we've got Paul commissioned by the Pharisees to go and round up all these believers of the way. He was on a mission and he's on a road. He's been commissioned. Off he goes, find all these Christians, and round them up and bring them up bound and they would stand trial. He was breathing murder. He was on a mission to round them all up and he had a posse of guys who traveled with him. And he was going with position, he was going with authority and a reputation that was a mile high and went ahead of him. Everybody knew who this guy was. Can you imagine what it must have felt like to have a man like that on the loose? Everybody knew what to expect. They knew the kind of treatment they were gonna receive from this guy. The man really was on a mission. Um, but he's on the road and he has this incredible experience that wouldn't have learned, he wouldn't have learned about that from anything that he'd studied. Suddenly there is a blinding light from heaven, an audible voice, he can't see, and God, Jesus speaks to him, Saul, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? Why are you doing this stuff? Um, and Saul falls to the floor, is blinded, and he receives an instruction from this audible voice, and he is left speechless. And the people that are with him, I wonder what they made of it. Here's this guy. They know how he behaves. They know how he responds. But suddenly, he's on the floor, suddenly going to listen to this voice that he's heard from Jesus saying, I want you to go and wait for a man. A man called Ananias is going to come and lay hands, and you're going to receive your sight. And suddenly, Saul starts acting a whole load different very, very different. And I want you to, when you go home and read Acts and you go home and read Philippians and anything else that Paul has written, see the difference in the way he behaves, the way he responds, and the way other people hear him and respond to him after this encounter with God. So Saul suddenly starts to allow others to see what's going on inside him. He wasn't able to hide this experience from the guys that were traveling with him. He wasn't able to hide the fact he couldn't see. He wasn't able to hide the fact that he, depending on other people, he couldn't hide any of that. So he went away for three days. Meanwhile, good man Ananias is having his prayer time with God. And suddenly God says to him, Ananias, I want you to go and find this man Saul. 
At which point Ananias says, what? Him? Have you not heard about him? Have you not heard what he's doing to the Christians? He is the last person that I want to go anywhere near. He terrifies me. He scares me. I wouldn't even know what to say. I don't know how to respond. I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't want to go anywhere near this person. He's dangerous. Ananias suddenly had to be operating something different to what I would naturally behave. I wouldn't want to be in that position. I would be experiencing all of those emotions and all those patterns of behavior. So Ananias, bless his heart, believes the word of the Lord and allows that to override his own fear, his own patterns of behavior, and he manages himself well, and he goes with love and compassion to find this man who everybody knows about because God has told him that God is going to use this previous terrorist for the glory of God. So off dear Ananias goes, and I don't know how he must have been feeling in that moment, went in and said, I'm here, and laid hands on Saul. And Saul allowed it. That was out of character. That is not how he would have behaved before this experience. And the rest, I suppose, is history. Saul receives his sight, and his immediate response immediate response, not I'm going to retreat for three years of training. His immediate response was a heart response of the goodness and the love of God that he had experienced. He abandoned all his ways of communicating, all his behaviors. His priorities totally changed. He, he was a transformed person. He was transformed. But what was interesting was the way the believers around him were also very, very different. Suddenly they were having to respond to a person who is a different person. Were they thinking, I'm going to give him a few minutes. I'm going to give him a little while. I'm going to see him in a tricky situation. And I'm just going to just keep a little bit of distance between me and him because surely his true personality is going to show up. Surely, in a minute, it's all going to look very different. But what you notice, both in Damascus and then again in Jerusalem, this is within days of this encounter and this man being changed. The guys in Damascus are risking life and limb to get Saul out of the city because the Jews were after him because he was creating havoc. So they risked everything to protect this man who had a reputation a mile high for murdering Christians to get him out of the city. Something very different is going on in that relation. There's a, there was a, a very special relationship going on with these disciples and this previous terrorist, now a brother in Christ, where they were totally available to him totally loving towards him, risking all that they had for him. So when they got to Jerusalem, um, the disciples, what it says in, 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 Philippi, in, in Acts, you hear how the disciples literally were, we don't want anything to do with this guy. They hadn't seen the story. They hadn't seen firsthand the fact that Saul had been in the, in the synagogue talking about the gospel of the love of Jesus and the gospel of grace. They hadn't seen that. They may have heard about it, but their response in their own heart was, I'm just going to keep away. I'm just going to give him time. But it was Barnabas. Barnabas took hold of him and said, I'm going to go with you to the apostles and allowed Saul to share the story of this supernatural out-of-character experience that totally transformed him on the inside. And so there was a whole load of relational changes going on. The basis of their relationship was coming out of this joy and rejoicing of a new connection that was born out of receiving forgiveness, about being seen, about being truly known, about not being judged, about being accepted in the process. These amazing things, and it was fast. It wasn't in a period of three months sabbatical while you're going to get your head around all this stuff. They, they'd all received this love and this joy, and this was the fuel, the oil that smoothed these relationships out. I don't know about you, but I would love a little, to learn a little bit more of how you do that. Like on a minute by minute moment in my life, I need to know a bit more about that stuff. So look at that fruit then. So there was loads of loads of fruit. I'm going to skip through all of that. Um, what we're seeing was a powerful environment that was living in an awareness of the grace of the love of God that was being poured out to every man in every direction. There was an environment where honor and value was being expressed in every direction, not just one. 
It was filled with love for one another to a point of total sacrifice. They chose to believe the best every single time. And that joy and that thanksgiving that was going on was the basis of their relationship one with another. Not personality, not history, not vocation, not what I'm into, not what stage of life I'm at. It was this central receiving the love and the grace and the righteousness of Jesus, and that is what caused them to celebrate. So when you read through the book of Philippians, that book is not written to an apostolic charge. What really uh, made me interested was the tone of the whole book is a book to friends. As you read through it, you just think, this is not a bad man trying to lay the law down. This is a man who's completely motivated by this new love and grace. I'm urging that church that was born out of a supernatural activity. Saul had been, Paul by that point, had been on a way on a ministry trip and he has a dream. And a man came to him from Macedonia saying, come and tell us your story. Which would probably have been quite surprising because they were probably terrified. But they wanted to hear the story. And as a result of him going and telling the story, God started to perform miracles and that church was born so when Paul is writing to the Philippians he's writing to friends encouraging them out of this kind of relationship to keep on going so Paul had the same priority that Jesus had when Jesus came to earth which was the priority of the other it was an immediate demonstration of Jesus's heart when Paul and Silas were in the prison in Philippi for preaching the gospel. They were not lamenting, woe is me, but they were enjoying. We're brothers, we're here. What we've got between one another is this love and righteousness and joy that we are together, we know Jesus, this is going to be amazing. And that was the environment that another miracle occurred. The doors were busted open, but so Paul is not running away from this oppressive brutality. His priority had changed. He was concerned about the jailer and the jailer's family. So everything changed within him. It was totally transformed. So through Philippians, Paul is talking about unity. He's talking about the reality of what Jesus has done, what he's given to us, the position that we have with the Father God. And everything that he writes points us to heaven Paul and Jesus are great models of a servant heart. And it's all about seeing everybody else succeed, not just about protecting their own reputations of social history changes. It's all about other, always about other. And the Bible is full of one anothering, and that, that is just such a powerful thing that we can cultivate and grow between us as we dare to show each other our true selves and start to bring strength and do this different model of relationship about not hiding, but actually celebrating and feeling safe and secure. This good and glorious work that Jesus has started in our lives is the work that we're called to continue. And this lubricating oil that we have is the thing that's going to take us forward. Jesus is the one who shows me how to be vulnerable in a safe way without a need to control what will happen if I do this. So learning to silence, if I show them what I really think or what I really feel or how I'm really doing, am I going to be judged? Am I going to be rejected? Am I going to be shamed for feeling this way? But by doing that, I am then open to experiencing love. So keeping yourself safe also keeps yourself locked from receiving this love and the joy that comes in. So we have a choice to make as we do these relationships. So you can keep safe, but you can keep empty. Or you can take a risk and be brave and live full and see that environment where it invites the presence of God. That environment, those relationships, that way of doing is what invites the presence of God. It's what invites the miraculous to happen. And so I, I just feel so passionately about all of that, that this is not just how do I be a, a better Christian. I, you, each of us has the power to live brave, to live seen, to invite, take a step forward. And yes, it's a risky business, but the prize, both personally and corporately, 
is all about releasing the love and the power of God. So you, as you do it, your, your love tank is totally filled up. You might need someone to pray. Yesterday, I was in town and feeling, oh my goodness, why does anybody come into town on a Saturday? I had to be there. I had a job to do. It was just like awful, awful, awful. And this voice pipes up out of the crowd, Jan. It was like, hmm? where's that? And the lovely Jenny Crow was there. And I was like, oh. And I just told her, oh, this is awful, this is awful. I'm preaching tomorrow and I am scared stiff. She said, can I just pray for you? It's like, yes, please. I don't think I would have done that a little while ago. I don't think I would have been dared to say, well, what would she think if I told her that I was really quite nervous and quite scared? But I stepped forward, and I was so grateful. And, lo and lots of you have done that this week, so thank you all. But it struck me what a powerful illustration. It could have been anybody, but it was Jenny. I don't know Jenny all that well, but she was the life of God to me yesterday when I was feeling awful, and I had a choice in a moment to respond, tell her how I was feeling, and she just ministered to me. And I, I left feeling, you know what? God knows me, he sees me, he reaches me. And the same is true for you. You can both be on the receiving end of that and the giving end of that. And please, two-way, do it both ways, because that's where the life really flows. Vulnerability has been described as an exquisite emotion. I don't think I could really agree with that when I first heard that statement. But when we are truly seen and accepted, we experience that love that I just described to you. I felt seen and known and loved, and it was a very alive feeling, so it's worth doing. So I want to ask you, who are you showing up and seen by in your community? At your work, with your partner, husband and wife, your close friends, your kids, your life group, your ministry team, your parents, your neighbors, anybody in your world, where are the relationships where you are daring to really show up with a deep inside. Just start with one and see where you go. But you can really live out these plans and purposes. Um, we can create that culture. If we can do this, even remotely, where we can be vulnerable without judgment for guilt, criticism, fear, shame, we will become a safe place. And being willing to walk alongside each other through pain without any of the above being brought into play, out of fear or not knowing what to do or say, we are gonna become a demonstration of heaven and a place where true transformation happens. That is what happens when you do that because suddenly people, well, actually these people are safe. I can tell them that I'm struggling with X, Y, and Z that I would never have thought in a million years I would dare ever tell anybody about. But vulnerability and transparency where love and light goes. That's where the power of God is unleashed, and that is where we will see true transformation. My heart and my vision is that Glasgow becomes the safest place on the planet, that people come flocking here because they know they won't be judged or criticized or shamed, that actually they will be led to a place where they will encounter the real love and healing transformational power of God. So that's what really gets me going. <laughs> um, so creating and maturing a culture of value for every man and honor it requires vulnerability, it requires accountability, ability, it's of ability, not your, what you're not capable of. Um, it means saying things like, I believe in you, you can do this. It's about growing confidence, about growing trust with yourself first of all and then with one another. It's about the ability to receive and give honest feedback in a safe and I'm all about your success, not about my own manner. And it's about being able to be fully present in any given moment. And for that to take place, I just want to finish with this. We need a change of vocabulary. I, have, I am learning how to do this, and I'm, I'm doing my best. But I just want to share with you the, with this, these phrases. These are some practical lines that I'm trying to work with and introduce. And I'm not always finding it easy, but I just want to share them with you. You might want to jot them down. Um, an environment where it becomes easy to say, I don't know, I need help, I'd like to give it a shot, it's important to me, uh, I disagree, can we talk about that one? Um, ah, it didn't work out, but I learned some things, I've learned a lot through that. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I did it. 
here's what I need. Here is how I'm feeling. I'd like some feedback on that. Can I hear your take on that one? What can I do to do it better next time? Can you teach me how to do this? Yeah, I played a part in that. I accept responsibility for that. I'm here for you. I want to help. Let's move on. This one should be in big type. I'm sorry. That means a lot to me. And thank you. These are phrases that actually take effort to use. And I would just want to encourage you to take steps to invite Holy Spirit to give you the courage to really show the true goings on. See, the, the true you, the true you, your true feelings, the true state of your life right now is completely accepted by Jesus, completely known by Jesus, not judged. He knows you and his heart towards you, wherever you are and whatever season you're in, is of love, of acceptance, of hope, of future. He loves you. He has dreams and aspirations. He created you as a powerhouse. Now that doesn't mean to say that just because you're in a challenging set of circumstances or a marvelous set of circumstances that you're either more qualified or less qualified to be used by him. I believe that we've got an opportunity to carry on the work that we're doing here to create an environment where we start to model the kind of connection and the relationships where it's safe to really disclose how we're doing, to, in, to be able to pray for one another without it being a judgment or a threat, to actually say, this is the real me, these are my war wounds, these are the things I did right, these are the things I've done wrong, I really need some help, you've got what I need, I want to be able to access your strength, I'd like to be able to give you my strength, all of these things. So, this is my message to you, that there is something that we are called to that's for more than you, it's more than for your family, although these are very, very precious. This is for us as a community. This is for God's kingdom community. So I'd like to just pray. I don't know if you want to stand to your feet. Father, I thank you that your heart is towards us, that there is nothing wrong with your eyesight, that you see us complete. And your heart towards us is one of love and acceptance and affirmation. And Father, we just invite you today to pour in fresh courage to continue this journey of building true kingdom transformational relationships and an environment that becomes a natural place for your presence to be outworked in our city, in our friendships, in our neighborhoods, and in our nation. Father, we just invite you to pour into us your courage with a fresh eyesight of what it is to be releases of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.